Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Have you heard of the phrase, winning hands down? The Taliban are proving to be a textbook example of it. They took Kabul, virtually unopposed by the Afghan army. They set an exit deadline, duly followed by world powers. Now they're set to announce a government. And world leaders are saying, talking to them is the only option. It's been a dream run so far. For 20 years, they were America's enemy. Now, almost overnight, they're being turned into partners. For intelligence sharing, that's a possibility says the U.S., to fight other terror groups. It's warped beyond words. Meanwhile, a technical team from Qatar has reached Kabul to restart operations at the airport. The United Nations says food should be the top priority. Afghanistan is staring at a famine. But Europe is more worried about refugees. They don't want any. So European foreign ministers are making a beeline for Pakistan. They're hoping Pakistan will prevent Afghans from reaching Europe. They may even pay Pakistan to ensure that. Clearly, the Europeans have learned nothing from the Americans, just like the Americans have learned nothing from their own predecessors who invested in terrorists to defeat terrorists. That's the way the world goes round. We'll discuss also on the show tonight, the Taliban may be trading Uyghur Muslims for Chinese money. Also on the table, apparently, is the Bagram Air Base, the one that America controlled for 20 years. The Chinese may have it. A nightmare comes to life in Texas in the form of a dangerous anti-abortion law. America's top court puts 14 million women at risk in a heartbeat. On the other side of the globe, China puts a ban on reality talent shows. Beijing says these shows were making Chinese men, quote-unquote, sissy. We'll tell you the real story. And there's water everywhere in New York. It's gushing into apartments, subways and stadiums. Coming up on the show, a report straight out of a horror movie. We begin, as always, with Gravitas Global Headlines. The United Nations' top human rights official in Afghanistan warns that the country is descending into a humanitarian catastrophe as it battles a drought and shortage of international aid. It is extremely important that we prevent Afghanistan from descending into a further humanitarian catastrophe. This as stocks provided by the World Food Programme are expected to run out this month. The U.S. is firmly committed to Ukraine's territorial integrity, said President Biden to his Ukrainian counterpart, Volodymyr Zelensky. The U.S. offered Kyiv $60 million in new security aid as Ukraine faces aggression from Russia. Schools in Nigeria's northwestern Samfara state have been shut down after at least 73 students were kidnapped from a state-run high school. Local authorities say the school was targeted by armed bandits. The World Health Organization is closely monitoring a new coronavirus variant of interest named Mu and warns that this variant could show possible resistance to vaccines. The new variant was first identified in Colombia in January. News reports say that South Korea is developing a ballistic missile that can carry a warhead of up to three tons in a bid to bolster its defenses against North Korea. South Korea's defense ministry says it would develop missiles with enhanced destructive power. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration is investigating the off-course descent of Virgin Galactic's spacecraft that took billionaire Richard Branson to the edge of space in July. Reports say the pilots were alerted to warnings mid-flight, which should have prompted them to abort the mission. 
The skeleton of Big John, the world's biggest known example of the dinosaur Triceratops, is set to go on auction in Paris in October and is expected to fetch nearly $1.8 million. The 66 million years old fossil has a skeleton which is some 8 meters long. Flash floods swept northeastern Spain in a seaside town washing away cars and trees, while other parts were hit by overnight storms. Most of mainland Spain is under alert for heavy rains. Cristiano Ronaldo has become the all-time leading goal scorer in men's international football. The 36-year-old broke a tie with Iranian Ali Dai by scoring two late goals that saw Portugal beat Republic of Ireland 2-1 in the FIFA World Cup qualifiers. Ronaldo now has 111 goals in 180 international games. The next best tally by an active player is Lionel Messi's 76 goals for Argentina. Sakia Khudadi created history on Thursday by becoming only the second woman from Afghanistan and the first since 2004 to compete at the Paralympic Games. The 22-year-old was able to travel to Tokyo after a secret international effort to help her get out of Kabul. That effort had been organized after a video appeal from Khudadi after Taliban took control of the Afghan capital. The Taekwondo athlete competed in a white hijab and lost both her matches. Eighteen days after the fall of Kabul, the Taliban are in the final stages of forming a new government, a government which they say will be inclusive and Islamic. It's not clear what that means. But reports say the new government could be unveiled as early as Friday, in the next 24 hours. Preparations are on. Piles of black and white Taliban flags have reached the presidential palace in Kabul. These flags bear the Islamic proclamation of faith. They will soon replace Afghanistan's tricolor. So the flags are here. What about the constitution? The Taliban consider the current Afghan constitution void. They say it was drafted under the influence of foreign forces. They want to adopt a new constitution based on the Sharia. Will they write a new one? Reports say they're more likely to restore the 1965 Afghan constitution. It was framed by then president Mohammad da Duad Khan. This constitution had a nationalist and Islamic bend. It is said to be in line with how the Taliban want to govern. Next question. Will there be a new anthem too? At the moment, it's not clear if the Taliban will adopt a national anthem. Afghans have one that roughly translates to Fortress of Islam, Heart of Asia. It may be replaced by a Taliban anthem, which is odd because the Taliban say music is haram or forbidden. Our correspondent Anas Malik has been tracking developments from Kabul. He sent us this report today. The Afghan Taliban are now inching towards formation of a government and sources within Taliban say that uh, uh, the approval to the government formation can come as soon as today as well and that would be in Kandahar. Sources also indicate that uh, the, uh, the announcement to the government formation would be done in Kabul and that could be done by tomorrow during the Friday sermon. Additionally, uh, if I talk to you about the situation in Kabul as we speak, uh, uh, at the uh, Afghan presidential palace, uh, uh, preparations for this much anticipated government formation ceremony uh, have been ongoing. We saw those visuals coming in from the Afghan Taliban's media team as well. Uh, and uh, by the looks of it, uh, they look all geared and charged for this government formation announcement. So the Taliban will announce names of people in top posts. But how will they rule? What will their governance model be? Like we told you yesterday, they're keen to follow Iran. The Iranian model is basically a mix of theocracy and democracy. So you have a supreme leader who is the head of state. In this case, it's Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran. He's the highest ranking authority, even above the president. And then you have the parliament and other organs of a government, all bending to the will of the supreme leader. Which brings us to another question. Who will be the Taliban supreme leader? No confirmation yet, but all reports from Kabul and Kandahar point to this man, Mullah Hebatullah Akunzada, the ultimate authority in the Taliban regime, much like Khamenei in Iran. Remember, Akunzada is a mysterious figure. Some reports say he's still in Pakistan. The Taliban insist he's in Kandahar. Wherever he is, he's calling the shots. No doubts about that. 
implementing his decisions is this man Mullah Abdul Ghani Baradar, the co-founder of the Taliban, also its international face now. There's a good chance he'll be the president. Rais ul Jumuria. What about the prime minister? It's a toss-up between Sirajuddin Haqqani and Mullah Yaqub. One of them would be Rais ul Wazara, or the prime minister. So this is the top leadership of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Their first task is to get international recognition. Will they succeed is the question. The world is divided and undecided and that's already a win for the Taliban because they're not getting an emphatic no. Across the world, capitals are debating the risks of recognizing the Taliban. They're in wait and watch mode. Not Pakistan and China, of course, they've thrown their lot with the Taliban. It'll be worth watching the Western powers. What will they do? The United States, for instance, has suggested that it will work with the Taliban. U.S. Army General Mike Milley has said that it is possible that America may seek to coordinate with the Taliban on quote-unquote counter-terrorism strikes by the ISIS, meaning it will team up with one terror group to take on another. Germany hasn't recognized the Taliban yet, but it says that there is no alternative to talks. Listen to this. Personally, I believe there is absolutely no way around talks with the Taliban. For one, because we need to solve practical things, such as keeping the airport open, and also because we can definitely not afford instability in Afghanistan, because that would favor terrorism, and it would have massive consequences on Afghanistan's neighboring countries. These comments were echoed by Qatar. It says isolating the Taliban could lead to further instability. It has urged countries to engage with them. What about India? It is talking to the Taliban. The Indian envoy in Doha met Taliban Sher Mohammad Abbas Tanikzai. New Delhi said this was to discuss the safety of Indian interests and citizens in Afghanistan. Today, India said the focus is not on recognizing the Taliban, but more on ensuring that Af Afghan soil is not used for terror activities against India. Focus, as a, let me reiterate, is that Afghan soil should not be used for terrorist activities of any kind, of anti-Indian activities, and we will try to focus on that element. So India is hedging its bets because the Taliban's record and loyalties to Pakistan inspire no confidence. They call Pakistan their second home, remember. That should be enough for New Delhi to be very guarded and cautious in its approach. Now, for all the countries that are talking to the Taliban or exploring the possibility or justifying their shift by saying that engagement is different from recognition, we have one question. What is the cost of engaging with the Taliban? What is the cost of legitimizing a terror group? Forget money, although that's massive. For the moment, let's talk about other costs. There are many, like women's rights. The price that Afghan women will have to pay for this engagement. The Western world champions rights. The US routinely ridicules, lectures, even sanctions other countries in the name of rights. Will it make Afghan women the collateral damage in this deal? Cost number two, a new wave of jihad. One terror group takes over a country and you say talking to them is the only option. What message are you sending other terrorists? If they win the war, they'll get a seat at global forums. That is the world's message. And this is the price that the world will have to pay for dealing with the Taliban. It's not just going to be a policy shift. Engaging with the Taliban will have other costs. Washington was among the first to accept this reality. And they seem okay with it. On Wednesday, the Pentagon said coordinating with the Taliban is certainly possible. Listen in. As far as our dealings with them at that airfield or in the past year or so, in war, you do what you must in order to reduce risk to mission and force, not what you necessarily want to do. Any possibility of coordination against ISIS-K with them? It's possible. You do what you must, he says. That's the American general. Let me translate that for you. America considers the Taliban to be the lesser evil now. Their focus is not the Afghan people anymore. It's their own security. And for that, Washington is willing to partner with the Taliban. The same Taliban under which the Haqqani network functions. Talk about double standards. Both the U.S. and the U.N. Security Council designate the Haqqani network as a terrorist group. Haqqani leaders carry multi-million dollar bounties. But I guess all's forgiven. 
Imagine the Taliban appointing a Haqqani member as envoy to the United Nations. What happens then? Will he be arrested from the headquarters? This is the cost of engaging with the Taliban. Terror becomes qualified as good and bad terror. And the Taliban get a free run. Think about it. A few weeks back, we were talking about leverage, how the Taliban desperately need money. The Kabul blasts completely changed that equation. Suddenly, the Taliban became partners in the war on terror. Their deal was pretty simple. It's either us or the Islamic State. And it's clear which way the U.S. is going. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says any engagement with the Taliban depends on U.S. national interest. The Taliban has made a commitment to prevent terrorist groups from using Afghanistan as a base for external operations that could threaten the United States or our allies, including al-Qaeda and the Taliban's sworn enemy, ISIS-K. Going forward, any engagement with a Taliban-led government in Kabul will be driven by one thing only our vital national interests. So much for ending the forever war. The U.S. is making the same mistakes again. They're trusting a group that has no history of loyalty. They're taking the Taliban at their words. But here's the problem. The Taliban are not a monolith. So which Taliban are they talking to? The Taliban have many factions, many ethnic groups. On the battlefield, they're all united, yes. But in government, not so much. The bickering, in fact, has already started. The Haqqanis led the siege of Kabul. They secured the Afghan capital, and now they want their reward. Who's stopping them? Another faction of the Taliban, led, led by Mullah Yaqub. He is the son of Taliban co-founder Mullah Omar. Now, Yaqub is a military leader. His loyalists control Kandahar, the Taliban's longtime headquarters. So to recap, the Haqqanis hold Kabul, while Mullah Yaqub controls Kandahar. And that's not all. The Taliban leadership is at least pretending to be autonomous. The Haqqanis are not. They take their orders from Pakistan. The Haqqani network is Islamabad's back door into the Taliban. America knows all of this. The world knows all of this. Yet the U.S. is jumping into a partnership with the Taliban. This shadow relationship could trigger a new wave of Afghan resistance, not for democracy, but for an even more radical regime. That is the cost of talking to the Taliban. There are no sure, sh short, sure shot options, no foolproof strategies. Because right now, the Taliban hold all the cards. So the erstwhile terrorists of the Taliban haven't even formed a government. And they already have partnership offers from world powers. The Americans want to be their security partners. The Chinese want to be their business partners. They already have a proposal, it seems. The Bagram Air Base and Uyghur Muslims. That's what China is said to be eyeing. In return, they'll fund the Taliban regime. The groundwork is already done. Weeks before Kabul fell, a Taliban delegation visited Beijing. We reported this. It wasn't some curtsy call. China was setting terms to a neighboring government. Their number one priority was Xinjiang. Beijing asked the Taliban to not support Uyghur separatists. They agreed. Priority number two was rebuilding Af Afghanistan. The Taliban get foreign money and China gets a new satellite state. Remember, all of this was before the Taliban captured Kabul. China started their work early. After the Taliban took charge, Chinese diplomats paid them a visit in Afghanistan. And China, remember, is one of the few countries that is not evacuating its embassy in Kabul. It says Afghanistan has turned a new page. And it's only a matter of time before China recognizes the new regime. They're waiting for the government to be formally announced in Kabul. Then there will be deals. There will be investments. And there's no mystery about what China wants. National assets. That's what they want everywhere. That's what the Chinese want. But in Afghanistan, they may have a special pick. The Bagram airfield. For 20 years, it was the home of American power in Afghanistan. Taking over Bagram would be a huge symbolic win. Will the Chinese do it is the question. Former U.S. diplomat Nikki Haley certainly thinks so. Here's what she said. We need to watch China because I think you're going to see China make a move for Bagram Air Force Base. Will the Taliban give it up?
it's going to take some convincing because Bagram is symbolic not just for the Chinese, it's symbolic for the Taliban too. Thousands of Taliban prisoners were detained inside Bagram. Dozens of airstrikes were coordinated from, from Bagram, so the Taliban will try to retain it. What they can readily spare are the Uyghurs. Nearly 2,000 ethnic Uyghurs live in Afghanistan. Their lives are in danger. They're scared of being deported to China. It's a legitimate fear. The Taliban want to impress Beijing. What's stopping them from using Afghan Uyghurs as an offering? Wouldn't be a first for China. They have a history of asking allies to do their dirty work. Take Turkey, for instance. In 2009, President Erdogan called the Uyghur crackdown a genocide. 2009. Today, he's deporting Uyghur activists to China. That is the malicious power of Chinese money. Uyghurs in Afghanistan have no allies left. Not the Taliban, not the Americans, not even hardcore Islamist terrorists. That's right, the same terrorists who talk about Islamic dominance and imperialist devils have abandoned the Muslims of China. They talk about freeing the Levant and Yemen. They talk about liberating Kashmir. But they conveniently forget Chinese Muslims. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. The Al-Qaeda statement on Taliban's victory. This is what they said. We told you about this yesterday. Liberate the Levant, Somalia, Yemen, Kashmir and the rest of the Islamic lands from the clutches of the enemies of Islam. Well, what about the Uyghurs? Are they not Muslims? Al-Qaeda's global jihad stinks of politics and convenience, something they share with the Taliban. Just goes on to show that all these claims of Islamic glory and brotherhood are bluster. Deep down, these are petty groups, ready to become pawns for global powers to control. They don't care about Muslims. They don't care about the Ummah. All they want is money, Chinese money to swindle and get rich. So the war in Afghanistan lasted 20 years. The story of international cricket in Afghanistan is also 20 years old. Cricket was initially played by Afghans who returned from refugee camps in Pakistan. In the year 2000, the Taliban lifted ban on sports. Today, cricket in Afghanistan is Afghanistan's favorite sport, and the Afghan cricket team is a fan favorite. But with the return of the Taliban, the fate of Afghan cricket hangs in the balance, as does the future of other sports in Afghanistan. Here's a report. International cricket in Afghanistan was born the same year the Americans invaded the country. In 2001, Afghanistan became a member of the ICC, or the International Cricket Council. In 20 years, Afghanistan reached the top of its game. It is currently number 10 in ICC's ODI rankings and 8 in T20. The squad has fielded all odds, and with every boundary on the cricket field, it has hit home a sense of patriotism. Cricket has made Afghans proud. So it came as a relief when the Taliban gave cricket a green light. It allowed the cricket team to honor all existing commitments. In other words, it allowed the team to participate in the upcoming T20 World Cup in the UAE and Oman. And also play a test match against Australia in Hobart in November. Wians Anas Malik traveled to the headquarters of Afghanistan Cricket Board. He spoke to CEO Hamid Shinwadi. Every regime has its pros and cons. And we are optimistic that the uh, current government uh, will uh, significantly support cricket development uh, in Afghanistan. Wion also visited a stadium in Kabul and caught up with some national team cricketers who were training there. This is Sharafuddin Ashraf. In early days we were scared but after that now we are going to see uh, like the government is uh, changing and uh, we are receiving uh, like the, they, they love us and they are carrying us uh, so we are playing our uh, games. What many don't know is this stadium was built by India. India has also built cricketing facilities in Kandahar. New Delhi has been instrumental in building Afghan cricket. 
For years, a stadium near the Indian capital was Afghanistan's home ground. The team hosted Bangladesh for a T20 series in India. Will this relationship continue under the Taliban? It's not clear. Which flag and national anthem will the Afghan team compete under? That too is not clear. What about women's cricket? Will it be stopped? Most likely. Playing in burqa is not an option, you see. And the Taliban have shown no flexibility on that front. Afghanistan has 25 contracted female cricketers, most of who are still trapped in the country. Another question, what happens to other sports? Afghanistan recently abandoned a white ball series against Pakistan. There were also no athletes in Tokyo to carry the Afghan flag during the opening ceremony of the Paralympics. This is Hosan Razuli. He had to beat all odds to fly to Tokyo. Rasuli's event was over by the time he landed, so he participated in long jump instead. Not every story coming out of Afghanistan can put that smile on your face. It's wiped the moment we think about the future of female athletes. Many have fled the country. Reports say female footballers were advised to burn their pictures and trophies. While men's cricket may be safe for now, the future of sports in Afghanistan still hangs in the balance. With Anas Malik in Kabul, Bureau Report, We On, World is One. For two weeks now, Pakistan has repeatedly claimed that it's not the Taliban spokesperson, that it has nothing to do with the Taliban's activities and that it cannot be held responsible for the Taliban's actions. But for all of these claims and statements, Islamabad continues to act as the Taliban's broker for Western powers. For countries like Germany, the Netherlands, Britain and Italy, their ministers and diplomats are making a beeline for Islamabad. What do they want? Managing the Afghan crisis. Well, mostly the refugees. They don't care about other crises. They just don't want Afghans at their doorsteps. And they think Pakistan can help. So on the 31st of August, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas visited Islamabad. He met his Pakistani counterpart Shah Mahmood Qureshi. The talks focused solely on Afghanistan and the priorities they need to, and I'm quoting, create a conducive environment within Afghanistan so that there is no exodus of refugees. Has Germany forgotten the role that Pakistan played in bringing the Taliban to power? Has it forgotten that Afghans themselves wanted the Western world to sanction Pakistan for its actions? Same with the Netherlands. On Wednesday, the first female Dutch foreign minister landed in Islamabad. She met with Shah Mahmood Qureshi and quote-unquote thanked Pakistan for its efforts in Afghanistan. Here's what else she did. Pledged 1 million euros to support Pakistani organizations who are involved in the support of refugees. Does the Netherlands even know the state of Afghan refugees in Pakistan? Let me show you. Look at these images. The situation at the Pak-Afghan border. It's worse than what it was at the Kabul airport a few days back. Thousands of refugees remain stranded at Spin Boldak, crammed like a herd of animals. Those who cross the border are not being allowed to go far from that area. They have no food, no clothes, no shelter. They remain stranded at a 10-foot deep trench separated by barbed wire. Perhaps the Netherlands should keep these visuals in mind the next time they pledge money to Pakistan for supporting refugees. Tomorrow is the 3rd of September and British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab will land in Islamabad. He is expected to hold talks for quote-unquote establishing routes out of Afghanistan for refugees through third countries. While he's at it, he may also want to discuss the routes that Pakistan is using to push terrorists into Afghanistan. And after Dominic Raab, the Italian foreign minister will land in Islamabad on the 5th of September. The agenda is to visit, is, of this visit to is Afghanistan. That's the focus. What does all of this tell you? That European powers see Pakistan and Taliban as conjoined twins. They're willing to work with one twin to deal with the other. But ask them about how Afghans are suffering due to this terror tango between the Taliban and Pakistan and they'll feign ignorance.
Back in Islamabad, Pakistan's Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid Ahmed continues to sing praises of his country's relationship with the Taliban. In a recent interview, he admitted that all top Taliban leaders were born and brought up in Pakistan and that it has been Pakistan's service to train them. और ये जितने नौजवान यहाँ महाजनों में पढ़ते रहे कई बड़ी माजरत के साथ मैं अब वजीर दाखिला हूँ रेलवे में होता तो शायद और ज्यादा बातें कर सकता था अब मेरी रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी है कई ये तालिबान लीडर जो टॉप हैं वो पैदा पाकिस्तान में हुए पढ़े पाकिस्तान में इसमें तो पाकिस्तान की खिदमत हैं कि इनको हमने तालीम दी और अब भी कई पढ़ रहे होंगे A Pakistani minister admits on live television that his country trained the Taliban and western powers expect the same country to bring peace and stability to Afghanistan. The double dealings of the west are the same as being complicit in the suffering of Afghans. Meanwhile 14 million women have been denied control over their bodies. They have been denied the right to abortion and we're not talking about Afghanistan we're talking about the United States of America this is not Taliban country it's the land of sweet freedoms and liberties the United States specifically the state of Texas they have passed a new law on abortion it's called the heartbeat act ironic considering how heartless the law is here's what it says any doctor who performs an abortion after 6 weeks of pregnancy can be taken to court in other words no abortions after 6 weeks of pregnancy who can file this lawsuit anyone maybe an uber driver who drove you to the clinic or a patient you met at the waiting room anyone can sue doctors for performing an abortion they could even walk away with $10,000 in damages let that sink in a total stranger can stop a woman from getting an abortion in texas united states and they get $10,000 in the process texas has truly outdone itself how is any of this legal abortion in the united states is guided by a landmark supreme court case roe versus wade it says that women can get an abortion until the fetus is viable that's usually around 22 to 24 weeks so most people expected the us supreme court to strike down the texas law well they were wrong on wednesday the the top court in america upheld this legislation it was a split judgment five judges supported the law four of them opposed it how exactly did that happen well some are calling it a technicality but frankly it's an evil conspiracy and let me explain how usually laws are implemented by the state government officers are required to investigate and report illegalities this texas law is different it asks citizens to report and uphold the law not the state which is why the supreme court dismissed the legal challenge don't think this was a coincidence texas framed the law this way on purpose to circumvent roe versus wade to ensure that the supreme court would uphold it This is a criminal attempt to control women's bodies envisioned by an elected governor and defended by a supreme court. Some of the provisions in the law are barbaric. For instance, no abortion even in cases of rape and incest. A 6 week deadline for abortion 6 weeks. Most women don't even realize they're pregnant at that point. But Texas does not care. Our creator endowed us with the right to life. and yet millions of children lose their right to life every year because of abortion in texas we work to save those lives that was the texas governor greg abbot how do you respond to politicians like this greg abbot talks about millions of children losing their right to life and who exactly are these children We are talking about unborn fetuses some of them are unplanned pregnancies this is not right to life this is about controlling a woman's choice women in america are livid hundreds of them are protesting in texas they cannot believe that this is happening in 21st century america unfortunately for them there is more bad news activists say the supreme court could consider reversing roe versus wade basically ban abortion across the united states I mean look we are incredibly disappointed you know essentially what happened in Texas is that they turned the clock back 50 years 
Uh, it is an incredibly dark day. And um, in not responding in this moment, the Supreme Court has effectively overruled uh, Roe v. Wade for women in Texas. Will the U.S. Supreme Court do it? It's certainly possible. Conservative judges hold a majority in the court. If they want to, they can strike down abortion laws. What does President Joe Biden say? This extreme Texas law blatantly violates the constitutional right established under Roe v. Wade and upheld as precedent for nearly half a century. It will significantly impair women's access to health care they need, particularly for communities of color and individuals with low incomes. Well, he's saying the right things. But can he implement them? The White House wants the U.S. Congress to take the lead, basically codify Roe v. Wade as a law. It may sound easy, but in the U.S., abortion is a political minefield. Recent polls say 54% Americans support the right to abortion. That's a majority. But still dismally low for a basic right like abortion. And politicians use these numbers to their advantage. They rile up conservatives with sermons on the sanctity of life. But what about women and their lives? What about their hopes, their personal choices? No answers. This law could set a precedent across America. Women in Texas will now have to travel out of state for abortions. Some may depend on self-medication. All of this could have been avoided if only society could bury its ego and narrow thought. Texas is a lesson for the world. You don't need medieval regimes to mistreat women. Men in Western suits are equally capable because democracy is not the full stop in the campaign for equality. It's the beginning of a long and hard struggle. We've seen the impact of war. We've seen the drama of dictatorship. Let's now look at the danger of global warming. Hurricane Ida has devastated the United States. In New York, water is gushing into subways and apartments. In Louisiana, the hurricane turned houses into debris in just five minutes. There are tornadoes, tornadoes and flash floods across the country. At least nine people have died so far. Over a million have been left without electricity. Americans say Ida made Hurricane Katrina look like a warm summer breeze. This is Newark Airport. This, a New York metro station. And this is what global warming looks like. It can catch you off guard. Turn your regular commute into a scene straight out of the Titanic. Make you fight fire and water both at the same time. New York is currently fighting flash floods. Oh my God! I don't know. Hurricane Ida has smashed the state. There is water pouring literally everywhere. Of US Open. Apartments. Roads. Washrooms. This is not a movie. It's all happening for real. In New York, also, it's adjoining states. In New Jersey, Hurricane Ida turned homes into piles of debris. Right now, I got nothing. All I got is I got a, I got a, I got a backpack with a few clothes in it. It was pretty quick. Um, wind, maybe five minutes, and then just everything was decimated. There are flash floods in Maryland. Miles after miles of devastation in Louisiana. How was it? Horrible. It's the worst I've ever seen. And have you seen several times? Hurricane Andrew in 91, I was 12 years old. Oh my gosh. And it was terrible then, but this, I've never seen it like this here. One million Americans are without electricity. 
people are scrambling to get food and gas. Sure At least nine people have died. This is all the result of just one hurricane. This is how scary climate change can be. The number of affected people and the economic loss is getting um, higher and higher um, because of the increase and in frequency uh, and intensity of extreme weather events and climate change. And we've seen this uh, this year alone uh, during um, this summer um, in the um, month of July, which was the hottest since records began. There were uh, heat waves and there were floods. But to give you some statistics, um, 31 million people were displaced by disasters uh, last year. Now the number of people who are displaced by disaster is almost getting larger than the number of people displaced by conflict. The numbers will grow. Hurricanes will become deadlier. More such people will be stranded in drowning buses. <laughs> the cars are floating! unless we do something to stop global warming. Dear world leaders, we hope these visuals move you. Down Main Street in Maniunk and Bureau Report, we on World is One. The world can seem like a dangerous place. Terrorists are in power, there are hurricanes, draconian laws. You would think people won't add to the list themselves. Well, I'm afraid you're wrong. People find excuses to get in trouble. Sometimes they come in the shape of online trends. We're talking about the milk crate challenge. Here's how it works. You stack, you stack up empty milk crates in a pyramid and then attempt to climb them. I know it sounds futile. It's also dangerous. And believe it or not, it's a trend. Here's a report. <laughs> latest TikTok fad. It can break your back, leave you bleeding, if not paralyzed. For a challenge so dangerous, the name is innocent. It's called the milk crate challenge. All you need to do is stack up empty milk crates, make a pyramid-like structure, and then walk over it. Basically, pretend you are featherweight with the balance of a circus monkey. Many took up the challenge. Here's what happened. Oh, shit. Hey. Hey. Wow. <laughs> yes, that hurt. No matter how slowly you climb these stairs, you will fall, and it will hurt. But people just aren't convinced. This man thought he could acupressure his way through the challenge. After a fall like that, he would need something much stronger than traditional Chinese medicine. This challenge has gone viral, and it's giving doctors a nightmare while breaking the back of insurance companies. But are we really surprised? Just look at this. The Milk Crate Challenge is being called a Neighborhood Olympics. Everyone, literally everyone is trying it. We wish we understood why. The Baltimore City Health Department has put out a warning. Please check with your hospital to see if they have a bed available for you before attempting the Milk Crate Challenge. Please also check there is someone to take you to the hospital because those around you are likely to be busy on their phones. Watch. <laughs> Bureau Report, we on World is One. With that, it's a wrap. Leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks for watching.